Welcome to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network CRE PN Radio. Thanks for joining us. My name is Jade Aaron Gross. This is the podcast focused on commercial real estate investment and risk management strategies. Weekly, we have conversations with commercial real estate investors and professionals who provide their experience and insight to help you grow your real estate portfolio. Today, my guest is Ferris Musa. Ferris is an entrepreneur at heart with a tech background. Ferris worked with uh, Microsoft and uh, he later left Microsoft to bring tech to industries that lack it, where he later found his passion for real estate. He founded Disrupt Equity. It's a commercial real estate acquisition firm that works to provide uh, investors with strong passive income by leveraging multifamily syndications. At Disrupt Equity, they focus on identifying B and C class multifamily assets with 90 units or more in key markets, including Texas, Florida, Georgia, and Tennessee. Their goal is to provide investors with strategic tax incentivized investment opportunities that create the highest potential returns. And in just a minute, we're gonna talk with Ferris about investing in multifamily real estate. But first, a quick reminder, if you like our show, CRE EPN Radio, there are a couple things you can do to help. You can subscribe, like, and share. And uh, always, we love to uh, receive comments. So if you would, uh, please uh, let us know what you're thinking. Also, if you'd like to see how handsome our guests are, be sure to check out our YouTube channel, and that's Commercial Real Estate Pro Network. And while you're there, please subscribe. With that, I want to welcome my guest, Ferris. Welcome to CREPN Radio. Thanks for having me, Darren. A lot of ear. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm really looking forward to our talk today. Uh, before we get started, if you could just take a minute and share with the listeners a little bit about your background. No, absolutely. So, I mean, I, I kind of have almost what's in my world has become the traditional thing where you have a lot of people in real estate that came from kind of a tech or an engineering background. So, you know, I fit that mold, but uh, you know, me personally, I mean, I was always been kind of an entrepreneur. I always knew I'd go off and do my own thing. And so from high school, I had my own little web company that did really well. And then you know, kind of went off to Microsoft, right? Kind of accidentally really fell into that. I did an internship there, love the people I worked with, the team. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to stay here, do this for two, three years, get this on my resume, get the experience and move on. And so I ended up staying, you know, three and a half years. I wanted to make sure I left not in the middle of a release, but at the end of a cycle. So kind of timed that well and, you know, went off and did my own software company after that and kind of had that going for several years. And like a lot of probably your guests, you know, start looking at, okay, what else can I invest in besides the stock market, right? Being from tech, stocks is the thing everyone does. But, you know, to me, I wanted to diversify a little bit more and started educating myself on real estate, right? Listened to a lot of podcasts such as this, read a lot of books and, you know, kind of learned all I needed to know. And then I kind of hopped in and figured it out. So before I even moved back to Houston, I had a fourplex under contract that you know, is now coincidentally about a mile away from our office, but, uh, you know, bought a fourplex, bought a bunch of houses and kind of, you know, got into real estate before I then transitioned into multifamily. So, you know, love real estate, fun business, fun space. And so I'm glad to kind of be able to share that. Awesome. So the attraction of real estate, what was the attraction uh, for you to to invest in real estate? I mean, for me, so I mean, there, there's a book that I highly recommend called uh, The Millionaire Real Estate Investor, Gary Keller, the guy that started uh, Keller Williams. It kind of does a good job positioning really just the, what I like to call the pillars of real estate, right? You know, what does it mean to make money from, an, you know, real estate investment, whether it's cash flow, appreciation, depreciation, leverage, right? All of these things compounded really turns into actually a very powerful investment vehicle. And I think a lot of people, and again, coming from tech, a lot of my friends are sipping the, the, the stock Kool-Aid and, you know, you tell them about real estate and what do they do, right? Everyone thinks they're a genius. They search, you know, they go Google it and say real estate versus stock market. And the thing that you see is, oh, well, the stocks have, you know, the past 50 years have averaged, you know, 10% a year, right? Real estate appreciates only two and a half percent. So clearly real estate's a terrible investment, right? But they're not really factoring in the other pieces of that. Like I said, appreciation, depreciation, leverage, cash flow. So, I mean, all of those things combined is actually a much more powerful. So to me, the math made sense, right? And then, you know, it is a real asset, right? It is always there. And, 
you buy it right, where you know you get it, you you can be pretty resilient, right? Because you know rents, you know, will fluctuate, but they're not going to fall a hundred, you know, 80 percent in a night, right? Where st certain stocks have done that, right? Individual stocks, so you're not beholden to some CEO somewhere not doing something they shouldn't do, kind of thing. And so, you know, for me, it, it was just another opportunity to to get into a different asset class. And as I got more and more into it, I kind of started to really learn the power of it, and you know, kind of run with it. Got it. So you said you, you had a fourplex and some single families. Did did you buy the uh, fourplex first or did you buy some single well, families first? I did it kind of weird. So everyone talks about on all the podcasts, you know, fourplex is much better, right? Well, the problem is I knew I was in Seattle at the time. I knew I was moving back to Houston and get into real estate. And there's not a lot of fourplexes in Houston. For those that don't know, Houston is one of the largest cities in the, in the world in terms of land mass. So in Houston, we don't build up, we just build out. Right. And so there's a lot of houses. There's not a lot of fourplexes. And so I know and I still knew Houston pretty well. And most of the one fourplexes that existed weren't in areas that I would want to buy. And so luckily I did find one and I've, you know, bought that. And then from that, you know, bought a bunch more houses. Right. Which made more sense. And then, you know, after that point in time, okay, I saw the power of the fourplex, saw the power of the houses. And again, you can make money in real estate a million different ways. There's not a right or wrong. For me, the residential side didn't really scale very well. And that's kind of what led me into learning more about apartments and then kind of hopping all in. Well, let's talk about that because I think that uh, like, like a lot of people, myself included, I was, uh, there was an allure of real estate. I saw people that were investing in real estate. And I remember one guy was telling me, he goes, yeah, I make a hundred dollars a month off that one, a hundred dollars a month off that one, a hundred dollars. I was going like, man, you know, you can add up, you know, pretty fast. You can have uh, a couple thousand bucks, extra cash coming in kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that was kind of my allure. Yours, was it the, the Gary Keller book, kind of the, the, the big picture and the math, or was there anything more? It was the big picture and the math for me. I mean, it's the numbers made sense. Right. And, you know, and then I could see that there is a path to scale that. Right. You know, I since didn't realize some of the pain points of the residential side, right. I have 12 different properties, 12 different insurance policies. You probably know that one. Well, 12 different loans. I mean, all that becomes a pain because you, they're all different. They're all different times, right? Et cetera, et cetera. And so for me, I didn't even have the headaches that people have around tenants. Luckily I had pretty good tenants for the most part, right? But it was some of the other stuff that led me to kind of realize, okay, this works, but it's not going to scale to where I want to scale it to. So. Got it. So you, so you started off, you got the taste, you realize uh, you need to scale um, what, what were some of the hurdles going from, um, single family to multifamily for you? Um, hurdles, honestly, not a lot. I mean, it's about getting educated, right? So once I kind of realized I wanted to make that transition, I was, you know, I was looking at doing my own smaller apartment complex, right? It was a, it was a 32 unit in Conroe. And I'm glad I did not win that because I was going to do that on my own, you know, no syndication, no nothing. And I didn't win that one. And, and I was doing 32 because that was about the size that I could comfortably do, right, in terms of cash. And I, I didn't win that. And instead started learning, you know, again, educating myself more and started learning more about syndication, right? And syndication, for those that don't know, it's really the concept of, you know, let's say, Darren, you had $100,000 to invest in a property, right? That $100,000 will let you buy a $400,000 property, roughly, right? Great, a $400,000 property, that's not enough meat on the bone to have full-time staff or system size or anything like that. But now let's say me, you, and eight of our friends have $100,000 to invest, right? Well, together, that's a million dollars. We could buy a $4 million property, right? And so syndication is the concept of pulling together, you know, equity to go do something bigger and better together. And so luckily I learned about that and, you know, I was going to go off and go do my own syndication, right? And, you know, also met my partner and, you know, we did kind of our first deal went really well, then started to kind of continue to do more from there. And so it's funny because that broker who, you know, that toured that 32 unit, I stayed in touch with him, right? And, you know, I remember I offered, didn't win, we had a coffee. And then about a couple months ago, I was asking him about a big deal that they had for sale recently, right? A, an A class, I think it was like a $50 million deal. And his message back to me is like, man, how do you go from, you know, asking me about a 32 unit to asking me about this massive deal? And it's kind of a funny joke because I told him the same thing. I'm like, well, how do you go from touring me at 32 unit to touring this kind of large deal? And so, yeah, I mean, hopefully that answers your question. I kind of maybe we've got a little bit long winded, but it's, it's education. I mean, I think that's the biggest thing, you know, people need to get educated. And for me, that barrier was cash, right? Not having enough to do a bigger thing, but then I learned about a way to solve that. 
Right. And I think you um, illustrated well the just the power of of you know leverage is really kind of what we're talking about because mm-hmm. you could only leverage uh, four hundred thousand with one hundred thousand, but if you got a million, you can leverage four million, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, with that, the the uh, the economies of scale. How how large was the uh, property? That, or tell me about the property that you did syndicate, or where are you at in the syndication? So uh, right now, I mean, so we you know the right. very so we've done nine deals, three two and a half deals have gone full cycle. Okay. The very first one was a deal that we did um, in Atlanta that we bought for oh man, it was about three point nine million. So it actually wasn't that big of a deal. We got a very good price point on it though. And we you know we sold that deal last year. And was it last year? The yeah, I think it was, it was last year. And you know, we've since actually yeah, about a year ago it sold. And you know, our investors did really well on that deal, right? I mean, they you know, they made more than forty percent annualized. <laughs> so wow. you know, it's you know, How long that was a deal that we knew that we can get in and you know, we, we can't go wrong on that deal, right? It's a deal that we had, it's hard, it's a hard, it was a very challenging deal for a lot of reasons because it was a complete turnaround, full kind of, you know, clean out, deferred maintenance, you name it, we saw it kind of situation. But we knew as long as that we did our part, meaning our business plan is purely built around me and my partner needing to perform, making sure things got done. It wasn't needing to bet on the market. It wasn't needing to bet on big rent pops or anything crazy like that. I like those kind of deals because those are the deals that I'm, I always know for sure I can get done. Right. So right. that was our first deal. And, you know, investors see that they make perform, you know, they, they perform, they start getting excited about making money and they start telling their friends. So it kind of grows from there. Right. How long did you hold that property? That deal was a, a little less than two years. Wow. That's great. That's great. So now, now that you are uh, in, in multifamily, what, when you're out, I mean, not multifamily, but just you, you've gone from the, the singles and the, the more of the kind of the residential stuff that where they look at you, the borrower, uh, the bank's looking more at you to where now you're looking more at the, or the bank's looking at the property uh, and the operators. Absolutely. Um, what I'm just trying to think. So the, Clearly, the, the, the power of the numbers is, is kind of like the compelling theme here uh, that I'm, I'm picking up on. Are, are there, what else about the property? I mean, are, how many numbers was the, um, the, the first property that you, you bought? You that, know, it was uh, 99 units. We bought it for 38,000 a door. You know, we since sold it for 71,000, right? But if you go, if you just do that math in your head, right, it's about a $4 million purchase price. We sold it for about 7 million, right? So, you know, we, we profit wise, right, from kind of the, the purchase price that sells about $3 million, right? Well, how much now, your, your, but your improvements, how much were you into? Exactly. As I said, so we, yeah. you know, we spent about a, a million, a little over a million dollars on improvements, right? But right. on the deal, we had also only raised, you know, one and a half million. So, you know, that one and a half million dollars allowed us to buy a $4 million property, right? and allowed us to make $3 million, right? Or two, you know, depending on how you, how you size it up, $2 million. So on that first deal, uh, what, what were some of the lessons you learned? Oh, man, choose your lender wisely. That's the biggest yeah. one. I mean, you know, that was a deal, again, not most lenders would do that deal, but we did have a professional lender that, that would have. Instead, we ended up going to the company that is kind of a lo- known to be a loan to own type of lender and and they, they said for verbatim one of the best one of the best turnarounds they've ever seen but they wouldn't approve the release of all of our capex money it was just such a circus so you know we ended up actually funding it more out of pocket just to because you know whenever you're running 40 percent occupancy you need to get units online right i mean they, you're running in the red and so yeah that lender was just they made they single-handedly made that deal twice as much more work than it should have been so that's the biggest lesson of that deal <laughs> No, that's, that's, uh, you know, it's a lesson worth, worth, uh, learning. Uh, hopefully you learn it from others rather than having to learn it yourself. Yeah. Kind of, kind of tight when you're, uh, needing the no, cash. I like to say we, 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 we've grinded our teeth on all the hard stuff. So, you know, we, we're probably, we know more than we should know about most things in terms of like lending and all that. I mean, we just, we've just seen all the things that go wrong. So. Gotcha. So now, now you're uh, a syndicator. You guys are, are finding deals. Uh, you're sponsoring deals, you're raising capital. Um, what's the, the most challenging thing that you're, you're faced, you face today 
and from a syndication model? Um, I mean, I'd say just it's hard to find good deals, right? Our, our last deal we bought was a year ago, and it's just hard to find a deal that makes sense, right? We're, you know, we're patient. We're, you know, we don't want to get a deal that we can't perform on for our investors, right? So we've since really spent our time, you know, we're vertical integrated now, so we have our own management company. So we brought that in-house, and now that company's doing third-party management as well for other friends and people. So kind of growing that because, you know, going back to the reason I left Microsoft, it was really to bring tech to industries that don't have it, right? Industries that are really dated. And property management is about the oldest thing, you know, out there. I mean, it's just, it's very notorious for, you know, really being built in the 90s and just kind of stuck there, right? Not enough companies have modernized or rethought property management. So we've been really reimagining that. And, you know, it's since worked out, right? People are, you know, they see kind of what we're doing. They're excited. And they, you know, whenever we start managing other people's assets, you know, we kind of, you know, gain their trust, right? On that sense. So. So in the property management space, what, what are some of the things that you, can you share some specifics with the tech that you, that you oh, found? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, let's just start with the most basics, right? Most people didn't know what Slack or Microsoft Teams was until a year ago, right? We've been using Slack for like five years, right? I mean, I bring, you know, it was the norm in tech, right? And again, that just helps streamline things, right? You get people communicating consistently and, you know, kind of, moving the conversation rather than being one infinite thread to being more conversation specific topics. And so that's a simple one, right? Moving to an actual proper task management system, right? And solution that everyone can see what's being worked on, people can get updates, et cetera, right? The biggest problem in property management is you get on these weekly calls with your property manager and we all agree on the things that should get done, but no one really documented it, no one really tracked it. And the following week, it's like, oh, did you do that? Oh no, I forgot about that, right? So really right now, I mean, you know, another thing too is just, you know, we have BI dashboards, right? Business intelligence dashboards where we have visualizations of all of our properties and, you know, all real-time data, right? No other management, we've had five different management companies. No one has given us that, right? And so, I mean, and, and the list goes on and on and on, right? We make our maintenance people take pictures of every single move out and every single make ready so we can see what it looked like before, how much money was spent and what does it look like whenever the tenant's going to move in. And does that meet our, our standard, right? And so really kind of cranking up that visibility and transparency piece. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that because I, I do feel like um, there's a kind of an old school that, uh, oh, we don't do that kind of thing. But, but the reality is I think that the, with all of the, the pressure from uh, new laws that are protecting uh, tenants and that kind of thing, it's almost more of a tool to protect the landlord as well. If you do some of these things like the, the before and after pictures mm -hmm. and uh, you know, more of a documentation type thing to where you don't open yourself up to any kind of a uh, nuisance, kind of a, an exposure or a situation. Um, so it, it is, I mean, I applaud you guys for doing that because it seems like it's a, it, it makes complete sense. I, uh, I question why others don't, you know, don't do that. Uh, the management is hard. That's why. I mean, it's a yeah. hard business. And so, yeah. you know, we have a rock star who kind of leads that part of the business and we've been just, you know, building the systems and the processes around her. Yeah. No, that's, that's great. Um, tell me about some of your uh, capital raising. Um, have you, has it been friends and family? Have you, uh, how have you gone about raising Raising capital Friends and family. And, you know, as we've grown, we start attracting more and more people, right. And for, you know, across the board, friends and family, friends of friends to, you know, people we meet at events and conferences and now private equity quasi institutional as well, right. We've had, you know, multiple conversations with those people and trying to, you know, I like to say we've kind of transitioned to being really glorified matchmakers. We match deals to equity. Right. And so, um, you know, it's really kind of up and down the spectrum and, because of that, we also look at deals up and down the spectrum, right? We kind of got our start with that CB value add play, but we're absolutely looking at A-class properties. We're looking at Bs, we're looking at Cs, and we're looking at Paul, so. Right. Now, the, the, um, in, in your, your whole time on the, the one being two years, I think one of the things that I've always found interesting about commercial real estate is that, uh, especially with syndication, there's a, there is a, an exit plan for every property I mean, they're, they're just based on the, the makeup of the investors, they want their money back uh, yeah. kind of thing. So there's constantly um, 
I don't say churn, but there's there's turning of of properties and opportunities are coming up. And I, I suppose, you know, being patient right now is key. Uh, you know, make sure you find a good deal, not just a, a deal mm -hmm. uh, kind of thing. Absolutely. Um, well, that's great. So, so uh, on the on the tech side of things, primarily you've applied that to the property management. Have you have you had any um, uh, tech applications for any of the other, uh, whether it be raising or, or, uh, marketing I mean, yeah, or... we do use a lot of different tools up across the board, right? I mean, mm -hmm. even just documenting and, and streamlining how we do every step of the way matters, right? We also have a team of VAs that we leverage to kind of help really systematize and help keep everything kind of greased and everyone accountable, right? And so, I mean, we, 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 I'm always very open to looking at tech and options and kind of how to do things. And so, yeah, I mean, we, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, we, we do use a system called the IMS investor management system. It's a piece of software that I, I pay a lot of money for. I'm not really happy with it, um, but I'll leave it at that. It is acquired. It did get acquired by real page. Um, but you know, it's helpful for investors, right? I think it's just overly complex for what it is, but um, you know, that's helpful. We use, I mean, we, it's really more about systematizing and making sure you kind of have a plan for all of the common things that happen. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. If it's repeatable, if it's something that's going to happen again and again and again, it's kind of nice to have some sort of a system as opposed to handcrafted solutions for every, Absolutely. you know, little situation. I get you. Um, <clears throat> well, so today you've got uh, how many properties? We've done nine total. So okay, and you said two had gone full cycle. Two, and then we have another third one that's going to go for sale here soon. It's, it's for sale. I mean, we're about we're we're going to sign a contract on it soon, very very soon. So gotcha. And have the investors that uh, uh, got their their uh, capital back? Were they saying, "Hey, where's the next one?" Or are they? Um, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. Three have gone full cycle. We have another one that's coming up. Sorry, four. But yeah, I mean, investors have gotten their capital back. They they're chomping at the bits for, for another deal, right? I mean, especially the deal that we're looking at selling right now, those guys are like, man, can we get into a deal by the end of the year, right? Because they're going to make a lot of money on that and they'd rather get into another deal so they can get the write-offs in the next one, so. Right, right, especially the bonus depreciation right now. That's Absolutely. That's, that's kind of a key thing. And on your deals, are you guys, uh, are you doing um, cost segregation? Yeah, we do uh, cost segregation and bonus depreciation on every single deal. Okay. Uh, that so, I mean, it. our investor, I literally have, so going back to the pillars that I mentioned at the beginning, right? Some people invest for appreciation, some people just depreciation, right? Those almost seem like contradictory things for someone that doesn't know, but, you know, I literally have investors that will invest only for doing the depreciation because they're looking at, you know, they have so much in gains and they're looking to basically write off, right? And so that literally makes more money for them, quote unquote, than the investment itself. Right. Because right? you have to figure, I mean, taxes, you know, 30%, right? So if you can write off, you know, let's say you have $100,000 to write off and you write off $100,000, you just save $30,000, right? So. Right, you know, right. Immediately. And, and that $100,000 write off from the depreciation is, it didn't necessarily quote cost you. It was a more of a, an accounting. Um, more of an accounting thing. And, you know, yeah. there's a lot of tricks to, you know, you do owe that at some point in the future and there's a whole. Right. You know, but really, if you're savvy enough, you can basically avoid ever paying that. So but there's a right. method, you, know, you have to have a plan, so. Right. Uh, with the sale of your properties, have you had any, um, have you guys done any 1031s as far as like, you know, sometimes the GPs and I've, I've it's heard of. It's complicated with syndication. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, something that we should have done on one of our deals, we just made way too much on that deal, <laughs> so. Right. Yeah, today we have not. No, and I think that's kind of one thing I've I've come to the conclusion of is if you're an individual investor or you you control the deal, and you have the entity that that's in place, that's that's an option. But syndication is more kind of like um, it's very comparable to the stock market as far as the in and out. I mean, you get in, you get out, you get your return, um, pay your tax, move on to the next deal, uh, kind of thing. But when the returns are you know forty percent annualized, um, I don't know that anybody's going to get too upset about that. I mean, you know that's you know, pay a little tax and, and mm -hmm. move on. Um, Ferris, if we could, I'd like to shift gears for a second. Um, before we started recording, I mentioned to you, I'm a, an insurance broker. And um, one of the things we do in insurance is we, um, we try to manage risk. 
And uh, there's a couple of different strategies we typically uh, employ. Uh, we look to see if first we can avoid the risk. Uh, if that's not a, an option, we look to see if we can minimize the risk. And when that's not an option, then we look to see if we can transfer the risk. And that's what insurance is. It's a, a risk transfer vehicle. And I like to ask my guest if they can take a look at their situation, uh, whether it be your, your properties, you know, your customers, your uh, tenants, your, your partners, whatever, however you want to frame it. But if you can take a look at the, the situation and uh, identify what you consider to be the biggest risk. And uh, again, for clarity, I'm not necessarily looking for an insurance related answer. But if you're willing, I'd like to ask you, Ferris Musa, what is the biggest risk? Yeah, I'll, I'll say there's two, I'm gonna answer two, two risks, right? For me personally. Um, one of them is just kind of really seeing what happens with COVID and the government stimulus, right? Our deals have, you know, I mean, our, we've collected a lot of money at these properties, but that's been because of the stimulus, right? So really seeing, you know, what happens around that situation, around evictions, all of that, right? And is the government going to help kind of, you know, bail out tenants or not, right? That one is definitely something top of mind. And, you know, that kind of segues to my second risk, which is cash is king. You know, at all these properties, cash is king. And, you know, we make sure we have significant reserves, right? And, even at the company level, I mean, we've been doubling down and just, you know, investing back in the company, right? We're in growth mode and doubling down and reinvesting, reinvesting, but just again, making sure there's enough cash for everything, right? So I'd say those are my two biggest risks and something that I'm, you know, just kind of very conscious of and, you know, continue to think about, so. Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, for all of the, um, the uh, COVID uh, relief that's been granted, uh, there's been a fair amount of, uh, uh, challenges presented to, to landlords as far as, you know, the uh, no evictions and, and all that. So yeah, it'll be definitely interesting to see how it all plays out. And hopefully there's a soft landing and we all, uh, we don't have any major crash. Um, but uh, with that, Ferris, where can the listeners go if they'd like to learn more or connect with you? Yeah, www.disruptequity.com or they can send me an email at Ferris, F-A-R-A-S at disruptequity.com. Or, you know, find me on LinkedIn or Facebook. So, got I'm it. Everywhere. All right. I'll list that in the show notes. And uh, with that, Ferris, I want to say thanks. I've uh, enjoyed our time and uh, uh, learned a lot. And I look forward to doing it again soon. Sounds good, Darren. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. All right. For our listeners, if you like this episode, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Remember, the more you know, the more you grow. That's all we've got this week. Until next time, thanks for listening to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CREPN Radio.